but it is good to be here. Amen? I was talking to Pastor Derek right as we started, right before we started. The first service was much more concerned about social distancing than you guys. I'm just saying. Like, we had, like, little pockets everywhere. Y'all are like, ah, forget it. We're on top of each other. I love it. It's just good to be here. Sometimes he just overwhelms you. But he's good. He's good. This morning, if you're here, we want to thank you for coming. If you want to give for the offering this morning, we're going to bless it. It goes in the boxes in the back. Pray with me real quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for every person that gives. Thank you for every person that's here. God, I pray that you'd bless those that give. God, that you would, God, increase them. God, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Father, I thank you. Father God, for your spirit. I thank you for your anointing in this place. I thank you, God, that you have been faithful to us. And Father, we honor you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I'm switching mics. This mic's too boomy. And I get too loud for that. I'm going to the yellow one. Check. That's a little louder, but it's better. (sighs) Well, I have a message for you this morning. I'm excited to to bring to you. If you're taking notes, it's titled, I've Got a Reason. Look at your neighbor and say, I got a reason. Don't get too close, though, because the Rona. No, I got a reason. A couple weeks ago, um, I spoke to President McGinnis, and he, we had been planning to have church in phase two. So we had been kind of gearing up to the phase two guidelines and the restrictions and things like that. And then I I happened to get a chance to talk to him, and I said, hey, we're planning for phase two. And he said, why are you doing that? I said, well, that's the one that makes the most sense. He said, "Uh uh-uh. He said, if a family can go sit down in Rockies and eat dinner together, a family can go to church together. And so I'm proud to have a parish president that thinks that way. I'm not going to lie to you. So we had to push our plans into overdrive to get ready because we knew phase one would be coming. And when I first started thinking about the service, Pastor Derek had asked me to speak. And when I first, like the epiphany hit that, hey, we're going to have church again for the first time, like inside in the building, a certain story came to my mind. I'm not preaching from it, but I got to share it with you just to uh, give you some context. So in Exodus chapter 14, it's a story of when God parts the Red Sea and the children of Israel walk across on dry land. Then as the Egyptian army chases them, God drowns them all. And so... Basically, that's chapter 14. Chapter 15, however, is the response that Israel makes. So chapter 14 is all about what God did for them. He, he, he drowned their enemies. He destroyed them. And then chapter 15 is their response. And chapter 15, verse 1 says, And Moses and all the children of Israel sang praise to the Lord. And the first line, it says, Give praise to the Lord, for he has hurled the horse and rider into the sea. They praised God for what they had just witnessed. And I'm not sure about you, but if you think over the past however many weeks it's been, it's it's 10, 8, 10, something like that. If you think back over those weeks, I guarantee you, you can I can give the mic to anybody in here. You can give me three to five things God did for you. He just showed up for you in a way that doesn't make sense. That necessarily wouldn't be something you'd predict, but God showed up. And see, what's amazing about that story is Israel is about to go on a journey to receive a promise that was given to Abraham about 700 years before this. They had been slaves for 400 years up to this point. And yet before they could walk towards what God had for them, they had to stop and praise him for what he had done for them. And so this morning... I really felt this morning we just needed to stop 
and praise God for what he has done. We could just push pause and say, you know what? I understand God's going to be doing this and this and this and this and this and all these things we're believing God for. But we're going to stop and we're just going to praise him this morning. Now, I want to read you a chapter. I'm going to read you a whole chapter. I'm not preaching on the whole thing. But I just want you to read, to read this with me. And I want to show you all of the reasons that David here has to praise the Lord. I'm going to give you three of them as we get in the message. But I want to read this whole chapter to you. So pray my voice last. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. And he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Thank God for that. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sin, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Now, i got to read that again because I don't know if you caught it. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Basically, God has not given us what we deserve. God has not given us what we deserve. I'll see you all next week. Like, that's enough of a line right there to stop church, spend the rest of the week praising Jesus, and come back. That's, that's all you need. That's it. Because I don't know about you, but I am horrible. I am an awful individual without Jesus. But he hasn't dealt with me according to those things. That's unbelievable. My goodness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, and his flowers are the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to your children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the, word of his, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, and in his places of dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Heavenly Father, I pray you let me speak this message this morning, God, with truth, with passion, with everything that you once said. Let it be nothing in my own opinion, but all you in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen, I'm going to give you three things this morning, three reasons to praise. The first one we have is from chapter 103, verse 11 and 12. It's, I'm excited for what he has done. I'm excited for what he has done. For as, high, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. A theologian, a writer once wrote, how great a load was sin, yet the distance between me and my sin is immeasurable because of Christ. The magnitude and the amount of sin that just one person carries is enormous. Think about it because you felt it. You felt the weight of your guilt. You felt the weight of the things you've done that you're not proud of. You felt the shame and those things. It's enormous. He carried it for everybody, yet the distance of which he has separated it from us is immeasurable. I have kids, so obviously we watch a lot of Disney movies. How many of you have seen the movie Aladdin? Right, everybody who's got kids seen the movie Aladdin. If you've had kids since it came out, you've seen the movie Aladdin. At the very end of the movie, if you remember... Uh, Aladdin sets the genie free, and the little, little things fall off his arm, and he's got the little lamp, right? 
Remember, he takes the lamp and he puts it in his hand and he like pinches it and it, it flies and it like goes out of sight. That's what happens to our sin when we come to the Lord. See, when we die, when we die to ourselves, when Jesus died on the cross and we come and we repent of those things, our sin is taken from us and it is completely removed from us. Meaning, when he looks at me, he doesn't see the stuff I used to do. He doesn't see the way I used to think. Because he removed it from me. That doesn't happen until I come to him and give my life to him and repent of those things. Then he separates it from me. Go to Isaiah 43 for me, Nat. This is, this is the Lord speaking. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. For my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, again, we're talking about him removing our transgressions and separating them as far as the east is from the west. And that seems like something that would be beneficial to me, like he would do that for me. But this verse says he does that for his own sake. Now, why? My little girls are in the room. I don't, can they hear me? Yep, they can hear me. Ha ha. One of the most frustrating things as a parent is having to correct your kid for the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Easily. One of the things in our house that we continually have to correct over is uh, my daughters like to climb the railing of our staircase. So not the stairs, but like the outside, like they just like to climb up on the side. And uh, kind of like I think they might have a schedule because one of them does it one week, <laughs> that was funny, and one of them does it the other week. And I remember one week during the quarantine, um, I'm home with the kids, and I come out, and I'm looking for the kids, and I can't find Bethany. And I look, and she is literally, if you've been in my house, the stairs get kind of high before they kind of, the sheetrock comes in, right? She, she's literally all the way at the top of the railing. Like her feet are level with my eyes. And I just looked at her, and she went, I didn't mean to. Like, how, how does, what do you say in that moment, right? It, what are you supposed to do? And how many of you know that the first time you correct your kid, hey, don't climb the staircase like that. You're going to fall and hurt yourself. It's loving. It's caring. By the 83rd time, it's not very loving. It's very threatening. If I catch you on those stairs one more, y'all know, y'all don't look at me like you're you more sanctified than me, like you ever yell at your kids. Don't do that. But here it says that I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Why does God do it for his own sake? Because when I mess up and I repent, guess what? I'm probably going to do it again and again and again. For example, last night, I blew it. I'm pulling out of Hannon Boulevard, leaving the picking up a grocery order. And I go to make a right to, to head down the road. And you ever been in, in one of those really close accidents where you like shaking and you freaking out? That ain't never happened to me till last night. I, I now empathize with all of you who have been there because I, I, I understand it. Well, I go to pull out, and I, there's a truck making a turn, and there's another. I see headlights coming. Well, a Nissan Armada going about 60 didn't have headlights on. And so I just give it gas, and I'm just minding my business. I'm on the phone with my mom. We're just talking about whatever. And I, I pull out, and the whole truck just shakes. And I just watched. I don't know. I felt like I was sitting shotgun in this vehicle. It passed right in front of me. So I'm stomping on the brakes, but it's wet and it's raining, so I'm sliding into the street. This car has to swerve around me. Then the other car that was coming, that happened to be a big one too because apparently St. Bernard, we don't drive little vehicles. And so that's a big one. That truck had to go up in the grass by McDonald's to get around my truck because I'm sliding in the middle of the street. I did not bless that person. I was not happy. I was like totally freaking out. I'm yelling. I even stomped on the gas. I don't know why I wanted to catch him. Like, what, this isn't like Mario Kart, shoot a turtle shell or something. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do if I catch up to him. But I was so angry in the moment. In like 30 seconds, oh, I shouldn't have been that angry. So I repented. And guess what? He forgave me. You know why? Because to him, that's the first time I ever got angry. See, he removes 
the sin from us so that he can remember them no more. So that the next time I get angry and lose my temper and totally blow it, it's not going to be the, I told you last time. He doesn't do that. That's why he can constantly meet us with such loving kindness and such mercy and such grace. Because to him, that's the first time we've ever done it. That is mind-blowing because I've always tried to figure out how does he still meet me with grace when I've screwed up in the same area a hundred times. It's because to him, he don't remember the other 99. He only remembers the one I'm bringing to him, and as soon as I repent, he forgets that one. I'm excited for what he's done because I don't need any other reason to praise him except for the fact that he saved me. That he wiped my sins away. That because of him, I am no longer subject to the consequences and the guilt of the things that I used to do. Because of the cross, he made me free from it all. If that's not a reason to be excited, I really can't help you. Like, Like there's nothing else that will excite you about being a Christian. If the fact that what you have done is no longer held over your head. So the first thing we see is that I'm excited about what he's done. The second thing. Is from Psalm 103, 1 through 5, which says, I'm encouraged by what he's doing. So first we got him excited about what he's done. The second reason is I'm encouraged by what he's doing. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your light from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. I don't know about you, but he satisfied me with a little few, too good, a few many good things during the quarantine. But it is what it is. But I want you to look at verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David's writing this, but who's David talking to? His soul. Now, my soul is my emotions, my reactions, my thoughts, my mindsets, me, my feelings. So David is... Saying this verse to himself. You ever talk to yourself in a mirror? You ever told you had to tell yourself to get yourself straight? That's what David's doing. Because there are going to be times that you do not want to praise the Lord. There are going to be times that you don't feel like praising the Lord. There are going to be times that you're not necessarily excited about praising the Lord because of what you're walking through. But what I'm walking through doesn't change who he is. But I have to remind myself, I have to tell myself, bless the Lord, soul. Praise him. Get up and do what you're supposed to do. Why? Let's look at what he does, right? He, forgetting all his benefits, it makes me think of Billy Mays, the old uh, TV infomercial guy. He'd be advertising some like super cool neon plunger, right? Like some really random product in the middle of the night. And he would always go, wait, there's more. And then he'd tell you some other really useless thing the plunger would do. Wait, there's more. And he would say this over and over for a plunger. Well, the longer I serve Jesus, the more I feel like I hear him say, wait, there's more. Because, see, before I got married, I had never experienced him in my life, in my marriage, because I'd never been married before. But as soon as I got married, God's like, wait, there's more. And the first time that... We had financial trouble. Wait, there's more. The first time, well, I've I've had to battle health issues with my breathing my whole life. But he constantly says, wait, there's more grace for that. See, there are things about God you won't be able to understand or experience until you get there. If you've been blessed with good health, you might not have to experience him as healer and sustainer and restorer just yet because you haven't had those issues. But I promise when the time comes, it's like God says, wait, there's more. I got more to give you. I got more to offer you. For example, Mother's Day, I told this story in the last service. Mother's Day, we're at my house. We boiled crawfish. My dad came over. If you don't know my dad, he's got a lot of health struggles. And he's been having a lot of trouble with his legs, particularly one of them. Uh, he's on two canes. He was up to one cane. Now he's back to two, and he's having a really hard time walking. We wanted to come see everybody. And I have a swing in my backyard, and he was sitting on a swing. But he started getting too hot. And... um. He wanted to go inside. So I go over to the swing, and I'm trying to help get him up. But it took us a really long time to figure out how to get him off the swing because the swing kept moving. 
because he couldn't, he wasn't strong enough to get to stand up and, and be able to balance himself to get just to walk from there to, to the house. I'm, I mean, it might be 15 feet, maybe. I don't even know. And I remember standing there, I remember getting angry. Not angry at my dad. I was getting angry at the enemy. I was getting angry at the situation. And it really messed with me because, see, I, I, I remember my dad healthy. I remember my dad running. I remember my dad taking me hunting. I remember my dad dragging deer through the marsh like there was no problem. Like, I remember all these things, and now he can barely get off a wooden swing. And that really messed with me Mother's Day. And I had to, I, I, I got stuck in like this little funk. And so everybody had left, and, and, and we're just like hanging out or whatever. And, and, and I think Caitlin went to sleep, and I just couldn't go to sleep. And what I had to do was I had to stop focusing on the situation. I had to stop magnifying my dad's condition and the, the struggle that he was having. I had to put my focus on the fact that Psalm 103 says he heals all my diseases. And even if my dad gets healed now or my dad gets healed in eternity, disease doesn't own my father. Disease isn't the victor in my dad's life. Christ is. And like I said, whether we get to see my dad run around again or I get to run with him on the golden streets of glory one day, it doesn't matter because sickness will not win in the situation. But if I don't remind myself of who God is, what's in front of me will always dominate my attention. It will always steal from what God is trying to do. Because every time you go through a situation in your life, God's looking to reveal himself to you in a different and new way. But if we're too focused on what's wrong with the situation, we'll miss out on what God's trying to do through the situation. So David says, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. He's telling every part of who he is to bless the Lord, to praise the Lord. Sometimes we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, this is it. This is what we're going to do. We're going to praise the Lord. I'm going to bless the Lord. It's not an option. And sometimes you do it angry. You ever, have you ever worshipped God angry? You ever just been like, I'm going to worship you because you deserve it. And the situation is, oh, oh, oh. and you just get, I got certain songs I play when I'm angry worshiping. Like, I just, like, it just, ugh, it just, it just happens. Like, like, I, one of the songs, when I get angry worshiping, I put on, um, I can't think of the guy's name right now, Hezekiah Walker, a song called Every Praise, right? Big old quiet gospel song, but let me, you ever see me driving down the highway and I got that on real loud? It's because I'm angry and I'm worshiping angry. I'm just going at it. I got good tents, so you can't see me, but I'm going at it. Because sometimes I will not give myself the option to throw a pity party. I'm not going to give myself the option to fall into anxiety or to fall into fear or to fall into... I'm not going to give myself that option. I'm not, I'm not going to let it happen. I will stand up and fight as hard as I can because I know that whatever is going on, he's greater than, and I will remind myself of that regardless of what it looks like. But not only all of those things... Why should I be encouraged by what he's doing? Because the first one said that i got to be excited about what he's done. Can you stop for a second and think of any good reason why God should ever use you to do anything? I can't. There is no reason that God should use me to do anything. Like the Apostle Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. There is no reason God, holy, perfect, righteous amazing, magnificent. He don't need me, and there's no reason he should choose me other than the fact that he wants to. So the fact that God is bringing you through something and working on you through something, the fact that that is even happening should be encouraging you. Man, this is hard. Is God leading you through it? Yeah, be encouraged. That's not like shout me down preaching, I understand, but it's truth. That the fact that God is using me for anything is encouraging because I know who I am. And if I was God, I wouldn't pick me. I'd, I'd pick one of y'all, I would not pick me. First of all, we gotta be excited about what he's done. Second one is we gotta be encouraged by what he's doing. 
And third is we have to be expecting what he will do. Expecting what he will do. Let's look at verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. When you research those words out and you get back into the Hebrew, what it's really describing is eternity this way to the past and eternity this way into the future. Basically, everlasting is before time started and after time ends. Give you a little bit here. Genesis 1, God institutes time when he says the sun will govern the day and the moon will govern the night. And he put time into place, the order of time, because we needed it. And so he operates within time, but he's not subject to it or bound to it. And it says here that from everlasting to everlasting, his mercy. That means God is the same from before any of this started. To long after the last second ticks off the clock, he's the same. So what does that mean? That means if he saved you, he will save someone else. If he healed you, he will heal someone else. If he set you free, he will set someone else free. If he restored your marriage, he will restore someone else's marriage. If he brought your prodigal child home, he will bring another prodigal child home. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no thing that he once did that he will not do again because he doesn't change. And so I should be expecting to see the things that God has done in the past. I should be expecting to see those things again. I should be looking and expecting, all right, God, what are you going to do now? We, got to, we did two services today. A lot of people stayed home because of different reasons. So both crowds have been light. You know what I've been looking at? I've been looking at a lot of empty chairs. But I ain't discouraged. I see empty chairs. I get excited. You know why I get excited? Because there's going to be somebody who's going to sit there who was once bound to drugs, and they aren't anymore. There's somebody who used to sit there that their marriage was a wreck, and it's put back together. There was somebody who'd be sitting there who was an alcoholic that isn't anymore. Somebody who was sitting there that was this, or that was this, or that was that. It doesn't matter the backstory because they once were lost, and they will be found. Why? Because he did it for you, and he did it for me. So what made him stop? I should be expecting these things. Now, on top of that, what's even more amazing, going back to being encouraged that he's going to use us, he's going to use you to do the things he's done for you for other people. Think about it. If If you've been serving the Lord for a long time, think about the people who held your hand when you first started. The people who you didn't know anything. Those people who answered all your questions, answered all your phone calls, picked you up, brought you to church, brought you home. Those people, you get to do that for somebody else. We used to say this all the time when I was a youth pastor. I used to say all the time, you don't need to be a spiritual giant to lead somebody. Just stay one day ahead of them. God is, is, is constantly revealing himself to me. So as long as you write with me, we're going to be good. Because I can go somewhere and you can follow me. But I get to be used by God. That's mind-blowing to me. That he would trust me to help somebody else. Think about it this way. If, if you had a, a kid that was off in the world and God brought him back. God brought him into the kingdom. Well, those, those people who prayed with you, people in small group that encouraged you, people who helped you when your kid was all kind of crazy, guess what you get to be now? You get to be the person that's sitting next to somebody else and say, yeah, I remember when my son did this, this, and this, but God's faithful, and God kept him, and God brought him home. Think about the people who helped you when your marriage was a wreck. One day you'll be the one having marriage counseling in your home, saying, look what the Lord has done. See, we have to understand 
that the fact that God would let any of us do any of that is absolutely so worth praise and so worth worship and so worth giving him all that we have, it's not even funny. But he is looking to use you and me to bring his love and his mercy and his grace to people who need it. And I got to be expecting that. I got to be expecting that. I'll pick on Raph for a minute. First night Raph walked into church. He's wearing a t-shirt that one should not wear to church. Just leave it at that. I got you backed off. And I remember my wife looks over to me. She sees him in the back. She's like, "Who? that's a little punk right there. Keep your eye on him. Like, All right. He's 16. He's way bigger than me. I can't do nothing about it if he decides to be dumb. I mean, come on. But I got to watch. That's 2012, right? Got to watch a little punk. Wearing a t-shirt didn't belong in the parking lot of the church. Become a man of God who can quote the word like it's an encyclopedia. Who can preach the paint off the walls. Who just got his master's degree. Who's full of the Holy Ghost. Who's a man of integrity. So you know what I'm expecting? Who's the next person going to be? Who's the next story? Like Brother Stanley. Who can go from being an addict to running a ministry, getting addicts set free, to now working with the sheriff's office, ministering to the families of the addicts. Who's next? Who's, who's next? See, because there's somebody else that's going to walk in those doors that has that backstory, that has Raph's backstory, that has my backstory, that has your backstory. Somebody going to walk in these doors like that. And we get to watch as his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. We get to watch him do the same unbelievable world changing things in lives after lives after lives after lives because he is the Lord and he does not change verse 1 of this chapter says bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name see sometimes when you think about what he's done for you a shout isn't good enough I talk about this all the time because it's like the most adequate example I can give you of what praise should be. The night the Saints won the NFC title game to go to the Super Bowl. Absolute hysteria. I ended up running into someone's house in Lexington that I still don't know them. And high-fiving and chest-bumping people because it doesn't matter. The Saints are going to the Super Bowl. Like absolute pandemonium. People are riding by in the tailgates of trucks playing trumpets. Because just unable to control the emotion because the saints went to the Super Bowl. Yet when we come to church, oh, when we come to church, we are able to control the emotion about the God who has erased my past, set me free from the junk I was in, has put me on a firm foundation, given me a new name and a new life, and is constantly improving me day by day by day by day. Yet, we might give a shout here or there. But see, sometimes praise, a shout just isn't enough. A dance just isn't enough. Giving an offering, an extra one isn't enough. That's why David says, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me bless his holy name because the only thing 
that's adequate enough of a response is, a, is your life. It's the only thing that's adequate enough of praise. Because we're going to leave in a few minutes. We're going to go home. And you might not be in a worship setting until next Sunday. If you don't do it at home or whatever, you won't be in a setting like this until next Sunday. Does that mean praise stops? No, that does not mean praise stops. Because my life is praise. Every day is praise. Regardless of what I'm doing, what I'm feeling, what I'm looking like, it's praise. And when I find myself not praising, i got to stop, adjust myself, and get back to praise. Because when I'm praising, I don't find myself depressed. When I'm praising, I don't find myself anxious. When I'm praising, I don't find myself discouraged. When I'm praising, I don't find myself battling those things. Because my mind is fixed on Him, and it's not fixed on the stuff that I'm going through. So I give him my life. Yo, I'm not perfect. I don't do it right all the time. I just told you I lost my temper last night. It's not even 12 hours ago. Probably. But his mercy is never failing. And he's constantly there. You may be here this morning and you may say, Pastor Chris, I've never given him my life. I may have given him a shout. I may have given him a check. I may have given him a, an amen or, or I may have even given him a dance one time. But I've never given him my life. See, sadly, a lot of people try to compartmentalize their relationship with Jesus. And say, you can have this, this, and this, but you can't have this, this, and this. And Jesus is not interested in coming into an arrangement with you of compartmentalizing what he can have and what he doesn't. When Jesus moves in, Jesus doesn't just want a room in the house. He wants the keys and the deed to the house. He wants to be Lord of all or not Lord at all, as Leonard Ravenhill says. And so I want to ask you this morning, have you given him your life? Everybody bow your heads for me this morning. If you're here, you can say, Pastor Chris, I've never given my life to Jesus. Never surrendered to him. I've, I've gone to church, I've done the thing, but I've never given in my life. If that's you, just slip your hand up. Maybe you have done that, but maybe there's areas of your life that you haven't surrendered to him. David says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, all that is within me. Maybe there's some stuff within you, some areas within you you haven't surrendered to him yet. If you were here when you raised your hand, I want to challenge you to do one of the boldest things you'll ever do. Cody said we had a hand. I missed it. So if we did, hallelujah. But everybody's staying with me this morning. If you're here this morning, you can say, Pastor Chris, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never surrendered everything to him. You want to right here, right now. I want you to, whether you raise your hand or not, I want you to take a step out of your seat and just come meet me right here. Stand right in the front. If you're nervous, grab a spot, make them come with you. one more time you might be here and you may have given him some but you've never given him all you said Jesus you can have this part and this part but I'm going to hold on to this one bless the Lord oh my soul and all that is within me 
all the weaknesses, all the shortcomings, all the stuff I think I do good, every single part, my finances, my marriage, my friends, everything, my career, my 401k, my hobbies, all of it belongs to you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. If there's anybody here, just come up out of your seat. Everybody in here to repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and that I'm completely lost and hopeless without you. But I believe that you died for me and destroyed my sin forever. So today, Come be my Lord and my Savior and give me the strength to live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now right now, there is a ridiculous party going on in heaven, so there should be one in here. guys do me a favor just take a walk with Brady and John you going with him y'all just take a walk with him real quick I want to talk to you real quick Brady's the happiest person you'll ever meet I'm dead serious on that too come on is he good yeah shall give it up for the man Jesus, is it good? I think we just, you know, you know, when I read this story, I'm going to be doing a message in a week or two about the, Jesus said there's more rejoicing in heaven when sin comes to repentance than 99 who don't. There's more rejoicing in heaven. There should be a clap off. And Father, I thank you today, Lord. I thank you today in Jesus' name. Yeah, amen. You can be seated for a moment. Amen. Amen. It's, um, it's good to be back in here, but we, uh, I'm not really back for you, but it's good to be inside the house and not sweating in the parking lot. But, you know, God was awesome that he would allow us to have services out there week after week. And so you would feel connected some way. And it's, it's bizarre because we talked about this so long about doing two services. We've always planned on doing two services. We just didn't know when to pull the trigger. But sometimes God pulls the trigger for you. <laughs> and sometimes God forces your hand. And, and we wound up doing 9-11 service. And it was God just preparing us, I believe, for growth. But it was, it was God forcing a hand. And I'm going to share with you from my heart today about how also God has also done something to your senior pastor. He has forced my hand to do something greater. And, this, and God, what I'm about to share with you, you got to catch this. This is so God, and God is so in this. Amen? Well, listen to me now. About a year or so ago, I was sensing the, to be a senior pastor, you have to have the call, but you also have to have the burden and vision. It's the grace. And about a year ago, I was feeling that grace was being lifted from me. But some, I've never experienced grace leave something. I had the grace to do something, but never, had, never understood. It's a weird moment. And, but I believe, though, that God was preparing me for something greater than what I was doing. He was taking me into another dimension. But as I started sharing with my press within different people, I started to realize something that, that grace to do what I had here was lifting from me. And I come to the place that when grace begins to lift, grace comes on somebody else to take that place because he's a God of order. Amen? Well, that grace 
was falling on two people. It was called Chris and Caitlin Rodriguez. That grace was falling on them. Bonnie and I, many years, Caitlin, we go back to Bloomquist when y'all didn't have children. When was that hour in time? Bonnie and I went to them. We're still in the building. We're still in Bob's collision. And that had not built this building yet. And we told them and we affirmed them way back then when it was just to me like, just like young teens back then it wasn't but it felt like it you know, it was just and we told them that they were going to be our successors we affirmed them correct and we told them we have no plan B <laughs> there was no plan B and so as I started to see I see the burden I see the vision I see the I see the fire it's called the anointing to take a church to another place. And I understood this, that when Bai and I helped build this place, we built this place that every seat would be filled because every seat was a soul. Every seat is someone's, every seat, every seat is someone's soul. And I knew that I knew that somehow or another, people call it a transition, had to take place. This is not a transition. This is a transformation that is being taken place. What do you mean, Pastor Dick? You know my heart here and everything's here, but I, I'm telling you, I know that this couple has the anointing to take this place to multi-services, but filled with seats in multi-services. I am so much know this. That I am going to not pass the mantle, the baton. Because people pass the baton, then they run, then they give it to somebody, and then they leave, and you never see them anymore. I am going to pass the baton to my spiritual son and daughter. But I'm going to run with them to make sure they succeed. That, my friend, is kingdom-minded. Because it's never about me and Bonnie. It has always been about it always has been about him. So I'm going to go back and kind of stick to my notes a little bit because I want to, because my, sometimes emotions come on, but I want to speak to this. I want to get it, make it clear. So now I know that my assignment has been changed, but I know my calling as a pastor has not changed. I don't have the energy to take it the anointing to take this place to a place that has to be but I know that I still have the ability here and I'm, I'm asked to stay on board here as pastors in this church so I'm going to me and my wife are going to stay here we have an office here we live on Riverland Drive what do we call you? call me Pastor Bond, Pastor D and Pastor Bond would be pretty cool what do you call us? Call us Pastor Bond and Pastor D or Pastor Palsy and Pastor Marzi. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you today. I'm telling you this for a reason. God has potential to take this place to a different level. So what's going to happen is this. People said you're stepping down. I said, no, I'm not stepping down. Stepping down means somebody takes a baton and he lives with somebody who goes lives in Florida and retires. I'm not retiring. I'm getting more fire. So I'm going to step over because if I do, three things will happen in this church. The kingdom of God will advance. When the church will excel in, in, in souls. When and body and deed can go into another journey of a great anointing of the Holy Ghost. When, when, when. So listen, August 29th, There will be a transformation here. My spiritual son and daughter will now be Bonnie and I's pastor. And, and you, 
don't know what honor that is. To say, who is your pastor? My spiritual son. Isn't it awesome that in the business world, that your son took over your business, he said, who owns your business now? My son. See, I'm, I am, I believe, the Isaac generation, the promise. The Jacob generation produced tribes. This is the Jacob generation that will produce harvest of souls. So I'm asking you today, are you scared right now? I, I, man, I don't know what God's doing right now. I know God's doing something, but you know what? I'm going to tell you why I know that I know I'm on the right track. Your two pastors here are having a boatload of peace come on us. A boatload of peace is on me because I think we're going to be Marzi and Pauzies in the house. You have solid foundation, 35 years of ministry, 40 years of marriage. It's called stability. And I believe between that and that, the church can grow. So I need you. Don't understand it all. Maybe shock for a moment. Good. You're like me. But you know what? I'm going to tell you as I'm telling you here today. God is in this. He's in it. He's in it. He's in it. And I believe what he's going to do will be greater. Listen. I need you. I need you to run with me this thing. I'm not passing a baton and leaving. I'm passing a baton and staying. Because why? I want to see my student outrun the teacher. That is a sign of a good teacher when his students can do better than him. He'll look back and go, yeah, we are a good teacher. <laughs> but listen, hear me out, hear me out. And I'll be the first one to say this today. On August 29th, Pastor Chris will be my pastor. And I want to introduce you to my pastor, Pastor Chris. You can be seated. I'm not going to talk long. have a couple of things I want to say that I want to make sure that you understand. The first one is that if it wasn't for the heart, the dedication, the commitment, the blood, the sweat, the tears of these two people right here, we're not sitting in this building having church right now. On August 29th, 2005, this building was destroyed. A tornado took the roof off. There was dead crabs on our soundboard. And it looked like it was over. But because of their faithfulness, on August 29th, 2020, this ministry is going to enter its next phase. I can't put it into words how humbled I am, how honored I am that God would put me and my wife in this position. If you've known me, you've known I've grown up here. I've gotten whippings in this building, on this property. Uh, you name it, I've, I've done it here. But I know that God is going to do something so beyond description. Because he's in this, guys, he's in this. Because I wouldn't be on board if he wasn't, and they wouldn't be on board if he wasn't. Second thing I want to say is I believe that God has given my wife and I a mandate. These are the three things that I believe of all. These are the three big things. The number one thing is that this will be a multi-generational church. That this is going to be a church where regardless of how old you may be in the physical, you can still be used by the king. Second thing is it's going to be a multicultural church. And we will, hear me out here, we will see the back of racism and prejudice broken in this city. It will happen. And the third thing is we're going to be a disciple-making machine. I can't wait. Like Pastor Eck used to always say, 
it's a good sign when you got to get the broom out and sweep the cigarette butts out off the front of the, the church because there's so many people here. I hope we got to sweep up beer cans. And I hope, I, I hope this becomes the most dirty church you've ever seen in your life because when there's people like that here, these lives are getting changed. The last thing that I want to say is I would ask you to pray for my family, but especially my kids. This church is about 60 years old, yet my wife and I, we're going to be the first pastors that have had young children. And if you know anything about church stereotypes, the enemy loves to go after pastors' kids. But it ain't happening to them three. Yeah. Thank you. I could talk all day, but I'm not. I love you. We'll see you next week. Heavenly Father, bless every single person here. Keep them safe. Bring them back next week. God, I pray that you would, God, remove any fear they may have about society opening back up. God, that you would lead them, you'd guide them, you'd bless them, you'd keep them safe. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.